Philip Negus from APL will be uh, discussing thermal considerations for uh, window systems forming part of the building envelope and also thermal efficiency. Philip's presentation will cover factors governing condensation and the importance of thermally improved window systems as well as low E glazing considerations. Uh, Philip's presentation has been audited um, under NZRAB, has five points allocated to it, as was Jason's, and is also ADNZ approved. Now, Philip has spent almost 30 years in the aluminium window and door industry. So, Philip, you just beat out Jason, 28 years versus 30, so well done. Um, Philip began his career on the factory floor, fabricating the product and moving through to estimating and project management. Uh, for the last five years, Philip's been working for APL on the market development um, team, engaging with architects, architects and designers. His manufacturing background affords him the technical knowledge and provides invaluable experience in being able to offer solutions for sometimes challenging details. Philip, good afternoon and welcome. Matt, good afternoon and thank you for that introdu introduction. Uh, we're looking forward to um, hearing more about... Um, uh, windows and glazing systems and hearing some of your 30 years of wisdom. Uh, so over <laughs> to you. All right. Cheers for that. High expectations. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, here to talk to you about some uh, thermal performance of your uh, window and door systems in uh, probably in a residential and commercial setting. Um, I do have a case study later on, uh, which I can share with you. But first of all, uh, just things to know about thermal performance. There are a few misconceptions around there about certain subjects when you start looking at the thermal envelope. Um, one of them is condensation. And this is a report that I sourced out of the UK. Uh, it's a little bit old now, 2013, from the Glass and Glazing Federation over there. Uh, and they talk specifically about um, condensations, the factors governing it, basically the causations and, and how to actually deal with it. Now I'll talk about condensation as a first up issue because it's actually a problem in our homes. Um, so these are the factors that are governing condensation. So it's generally it's the water, uh, the vapour content within the air or relative humidity, the inside room temperature versus the outside room temperature. And of course then the temperature differential between the two which causes uh, condensation. So it's not a window problem. I've had people ring me up after they've had their double glazing installed. Uh, it may have been a new build and they say that the home is, you know, the windows particularly are just streaming with water uh, and the double glazing has actually made their house worse with regards to condensation. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is there's a lot of uh, water uh, built into products that go into a new home, for example. And another thing that this report actually highlights, not on this particular slide, but I can tell you that in an average sized home where they've used a timber slab, uh, sorry, concrete slab with a timber frame, uh, let's say, I don't know, a plasterboard with paint on the inside, generally there's about 7,000 litres of embodied water in that building when it's new there's all water content built into all of those products. And it takes about two good years for a house to dry out. But as a result, in that, in that sort of drying out period, you do get elevated uh, levels of condensation. And a lot of that's due to the fact uh, that people either don't open their windows or in combination with that, that the modern buildings uh, are designed to eliminate drafts and they don't have the natural ventilation that some of the older houses have. So they, they do become moisture traps. So, uh, so as I sort of mentioned and touched on before, the occurrence of condensation in buildings is a result of uh, complex interactions between the environment, uh, construction methods, building occupants behavior. Uh, it can be reversed uh, where construction materials are warmer or you introduce ventilation uh, to get rid of the condensation. And I think we've all seen the image on the left. Uh, you know, typically we see a lot on bedroom windows because people uh, go into their bedrooms at night, close the windows for various reasons, whether it be for security or because it's cold outside. Uh, and but when you wake up in the morning, of course, you've got condensation on your glass and sometimes your aluminium frames. 
This is just uh, an interesting infographic, infographic from Brains, um, you know, um, sort of trying to support tips for a healthy home. Um, and I think we've all seen the adverts on TV about um, warming up your home and airing it out. Um, so there's lots of different strategies around that, but hey, the easiest thing is, is to open your windows and just ventilate your home and get all of that warm, moist air out of it. And you don't have to do it very often. Uh, it doesn't actually require um, a lot of window opening or closing to actually ventilate a space. I think the Germans actually did some research. Uh, they were asking that very question and they realized that you only have to really open windows about four times a day for about 10 minutes to effectively control condensation in a home. So here we have a range of products which we've had for quite some time now. Firmly broken aluminium products, we've got uh, about three of those. This is a residential system, so more suited to uh, residential buildings where you're designing the windows and doors up to say 2.1, maybe 2.2 high. Uh, I've got a larger glazing platform which can accommodate a 32 millimeter IGU. And I've put on this slide a U and an R value there uh, using a high performance lovey glass. Um, the eagle eyed uh, people in the audience will notice that there is actually a couple of bits of information there with regards to in wall installation. Uh, so the U and the R values of course improve uh, when you actually pull your windows into an in wall installation detail or a recessed window detail. The problem we have in the New Zealand uh, building code at the moment is there isn't a compliant in wall installation detail at the moment. Uh, there are several projects underway uh, by various different people. Uh, one of them is the Window and Glass Association uh, have been working on some recessed window details um, and they're going to put that forward as a proposal to brands and MB to become part of E2 AS1. So they're on their way, but I've been talking about that for about two years. Uh, generally when these things uh, take place and you're looking at a code change, they sort of, uh, they move at a, a glacial pace. So in addition to the residential product, uh, we have the Metro Thermal Heart. Um, again, the same glazing platform, the same U and R values, uh, except for the fact that it has been tested to extra high, whereas the residential system uh, has only been tested up to very high. Uh, you can increase the spans and the sizes on the Metro series. In fact, it does have quite a high performance uh, capacity. And the other good thing about the Metro series is you can have dual colors. So the profile actually uh, starts as two bits of metal, as you can see on that image there. Uh, we actually zip those together after they've been powder coated, whereas the residential system, uh, in, effort, in an effort to try and keep the cost down, we zip the profiles together in mill finish and then go and powder coat it or anodize it or whatever it has to be, be done to it, whereas surface finish. But with the Metro series, we do offer the dual colors, which can be a bit of an advantage. Actually, oh no, actually, I'll just go back to that. One more thing I need to mention about the Metro series and dual colors is, um, and it's a global problem with regards to thermally broken aluminum systems, is you do get uh, cases where the outside surface of the aluminum will heat up and it will want to expand and it will. But because the temperature on the inside is not the same as the, what the piece on the outside, you will affect, in effect get bowing in the aluminium extrusion. Now it's more prevalent and noticeable on products like sliding doors. Uh, in New Zealand we've had multiple, multiple cases of Metro series sliding doors where uh, they may have chosen a dark color on the outside, light color on the inside. Uh, it's facing north or northwest. So it's getting a reasonable amount of sunshine on it. The outside surface heats up it expands and of course it then creates a bow within say a lock style or perhaps even an interlocker. What happens or what can happen is the client can open the door in the morning, the profile can then heat up on the outside uh, creating a bow in the profile and then the client wants to close the door and it won't or no longer fit into the frame. 
Uh, so they have to then fight with the, with the extrusion to try and pull it back into the frame so they can lock the door and go out, which is a bit of an issue. As I say, it's a global problem. It's not necessarily unique to New Zealand, and that's what happens with all thermally broken products. Uh, there is one strategy of, of dealing with that. Uh, it's the only one we have at this stage. And that is simply, and it usually only happens on a lock style. So it's, it's on a sliding door panel and it's where the handle is locking into the frame because it actually doesn't have a lot of strength within that lock style itself. It does have, uh, there's more susceptible to, to bowing. So what we've suggested as a solution is you simply replace the thermally broken style with a solid aluminium style, and that actually stops that thermal expansion and the bowing happening on that particular extrusion. It doesn't really compromise the uh, thermal efficiency or performance of the frame. In fact, you can change all the verticals within a sliding door, and it only actually changes its thermal performance by about 3%. About four years ago, we uh, released Climber, a UPVC range of windows and doors for the New Zealand conditions. Uh, we didn't bring it here and release it because um, we just wanted to bring another white, chunky UPVC frame. Uh, it was really for people who, uh, what I would call thermal enthusiasts. So it's not for everyone. Uh, some people don't like the size of the profiles. Uh, some people don't like the fact that it's a plastic window, primarily made up of uh, petroleum products and salt. Um, other people don't like it because it's white. Um, so various reasons why you may not like it, but then there are people who do like it because it has some extraordinary thermal characteristics. Uh, and that was really the only reason why we bought it here. So you can see that the U and the R values exceed the aluminium systems. And of course you put that into a, an in wall uh, detail, believe it or not, it doesn't actually improve the performance of a UPVC product because it's already performing very well. But what you can do with Climber is you can actually fit a triple glaze unit into it, which currently we don't have available in any of our aluminium offerings. So it does have that added advantage of being able to, to get higher performing um, you know, triple glaze units into it if you want to get a uh, better performance out of your window system. Not a lot of people do know that we do actually have a thermally broken commercial system, a uh, facade system. Uh, we're seeing a lot more commercial buildings where they're uh, looking to uh, get better thermal efficiency on the facades. Because obviously they usually uh, wrap the building up. So there's a lot of glass and a lot of aluminium uh, so we do have this thermally broken 168 structurally glazed system. Uh, again, the U and R values are there. Very dependent on the glass selection, of course, because uh, most of the facade will be, uh, the visible part of the facade will be the glazing. Tested to specific uh, wind pressures. I think it's up to an over 4 kPa and used on a number of commercial buildings around New Zealand. In addition to the uh, vertical windows, we also have uh, thermally broken roof windows, uh, which, hey, in my mind, if you're going to put a roof light uh, into a residential building, you wouldn't put anything else but a thermally broken window in there. It does have some size limitations. Uh, at this stage, um, around about sort of four and a half to five metres in length. Um, and then you then have to sort of balance that with the size of the glass panels you put it in there. There are a range of structurally glazed mullions, so you can break the glass up into panels. Um, but again, you know, there are limitations around how big you can build these things. This was a chart that we put together to try and assist architects and designers, just to give them an indication of where we position our products in the marketplace. Uh, really to use the residential solid frame as a baseline product on the bottom left. Um, hey, tested to extra high, can be built up to 2.1 high, uh, at a rough price of about $500 a square meter. And then progressively you kind of go up that ladder. So you've got the residential thermal product, which is about plus 15%. In fact, our thermal products tend to be 
around about that 15% more expensive than it's their solid framed equivalents. So that is, that's the same as the residential versus the metro and also in our uh, structurally glazed facade systems. Uh, climbers in there, of course, uh, at about 680 a square meter, which is about the same as Metro Thermal Heart. And uh, climber is also available with an aluminium clip on the outside. So if you wanted to introduce color, uh, or if you wanted to have an aluminium facing on the outside, because you just didn't like the, uh, the white PVC, you can actually choose that, but it has to remain white on the inside. There are actually other methods of putting color onto UPVC. You can foil them. Uh, but because they're using such low volumes here in New Zealand, uh, they typically tend to be fairly uh, cost prohibitive. So, as I said, you know, when we released uh, the UPVC, UPVC product about four years ago, we partnered with a German company called Comaling. They've been manufacturing UPVC windows for about as long as we've been doing aluminium. This is a fairly typical European style UPVC window. It's generally an equal leg frame. Uh, construction methods are a little bit different uh, in Europe than they are here in New Zealand. So we actually asked Comaling to design a specific frame for the New Zealand market. And that involved uh, creating a facing uh, for the frame and then a liner entry. So you could actually staple a jam liner to it and the window itself can be installed just like any other window. Unlike our aluminium systems, um, I'm talking about all of our aluminium systems. You know, we've got about 7,000 shapes in our die library. Uh, with Climber, we just simply bought about 22 extrusions, so not very many. Uh, very limited into what you can build uh, with a UPVC system, and of course limited in size as well. This is a comparison chart showing the, uh, the different R and U values of the various systems. You'll see at the top there that the architectural series is the poorest performing um, window system that we have, mainly due to the fact that, that it's the mass of metal that's there. And then as you obviously go down that chart, the improvement uh, is quite evident, uh, finishing up with climber. Interestingly enough, we do, uh, we realize that the future of building in New Zealand uh, is all about thermal efficiency and energy efficiency. And hey, we've certainly seen a big difference in the last even just four years with regards to the use of thermally improved products. I think uh, when I started at APL, um, our thermal products were being used about 5% of the time when we looked back at our sales and tonnages. Uh, that figure is now up to about 12% and it is continuing to grow. So we're gonna see uh, much wider use of thermally broken products as we move forward in the industry. Um, so one of the projects we actually ha currently have under underway is reviewing all of our system offerings. And we, are, well, we have developed a range of products which will carry us forward for perhaps the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, they're gonna be um, a, a mixture of uh, cold frame or solid frames, if you like, and warm frames or thermally broken frames with a couple of different uh, glazing platforms ranging from about 44 up to 56, because that's where we see the future of window systems in New Zealand. This comparison chart is showing those commercial systems. So the top one is a non thermally broken 150 structural glaze system. Uh, then, of course, you've got the Arc, Arc Series, which is in the, the middle there, and then the uh, thermally broken structurally glazed system. So, hey, the numbers are very small when you compare it to building envelope and other, you know, uh, suppliers of bats and wall insulation and so forth and so on. But uh, hey, in my experience, any improvement you make to a window system uh, generally makes quite a big difference to the building envelope because it's already the poorest performing part of the envelope. So the current installation offerings, as I mentioned before, are uh, generally over cladding, over a vented cavity space, which doesn't necessarily allow a window system to perform all that well. Uh, and as I mentioned, there are 
a couple of projects in the wings with regards to in-wall installation details. These particular details uh, formed part of our submission to Brands about a year and a half ago. Uh, it does rely on a flashing subframe. Uh, it can make the installation uh, obviously more complex, uh, more expensive, but architecturally actually looks quite a lot better. Um, yeah, we'll see where that's going. At this stage, it's um, the Window and Glass Association are pro progressing this on an industry level, uh, but we are working on something ourselves which will complement those um, aforementioned redesigned products that we're thinking about. So this is a case study I just wanted to show you. This is actually Tūranga, which is the new uh, Christchurch library, uh, which was completed about a year and a half ago. Uh, architect has uh, designed the building, South Base Construction uh, built it. Alutech is a large uh, window manufacturer in Christchurch, uh, a vantage fabricator of ours, and they used a combination of products, but predominantly the 168 mm structurally glazed, thermally broken, system. So that's a shot of the library itself. It's pretty impressive. Um, there was obviously a focus on visible light transmission uh, as well as solar control. Uh, the extensive use of box fins on the western facade uh, and that was purely again for uh, shading and solar control. And uh, again another shot of the street elevation. They did actually use uh, tinted glass on the um, north elevation to reduce some of that solar heat gain. Uh, and I think it has a shading coefficient of about 0.68. And they also uh, put an overhead glazing system in there. And you can see on this image that they've actually got some, uh, like a glass frit on the, the panels up there and again, there was about 30% coverage of the glass with the frit. They wanted to retain, obviously, that really high light transmission, but they wanted to reduce that solar heat gain, and you get lots and lots of that uh, through a roof light system. But a frit is a very good way of actually uh, dealing with that. So I thought we'd also talk about glass because obviously it's a major component uh, within our system, uh, obviously the largest surface area. This chart was put together uh, by a colleague of mine. And what those, uh, the blue and the red column are indicating uh, the shading coefficient and the U value of the various glasses. So starting at the top, um, that's actually just a clear double glazing. Uh, then we, you move into a low E and there's a couple of other low E's in the middle there. Generally the difference between these low E's uh, not apparent at this stage, but when I highlight uh, some of these other boxes, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is the very top double glazed unit in the light green is just a, a clear on clear, uh, argon filled. It's got a visible light transmission of 80%. Uh, but that's only got a U value of about 2.6, which is you know not that great. Then you've got your entry level low E's. So it's a Climber Guard N70. Uh, it's got a visible light transmission of about 67% and a U value of 1.5. So you're starting to get some really good performance in your glass at that point. We skip right down to the bottom in the blue box. That is a high performance, low E glazing, uh, probably more suited to a commercial application. Visible light transmission is down to 48%, but it's got a, a pretty good performance uh, with regards to its U value. The point I'm trying to make with this slide is that there are a number of different low E glasses available. They'll give you slightly different performance, and of course different performance on its position within the double glazed unit. But I think you have to be aware of uh, visible light transmission, uh, probably more importantly than anything else, because it also affects your shading coefficient. So if you have it too dark, of course, then people are turning on lights uh, just on a normal work day. If it gets a bit cloudy, with uh, if a light transmission is too high, then it can, of course you get too much solar heat gain. We get this question uh, quite a lot, uh, triple glazing versus uh, double glazing. So I got my colleague to, to put this together. And again, what we're highlighting here is the performance difference between a, uh, I guess a high performance 
double glazed unit versus a high performance triple glazed unit. Now a lot of triple glazing in Europe, they use four millimeter glass. In New Zealand, we don't, we don't do that. Uh, so we use five millimeter glass combined with the air spaces. So again, the visible light transmission, there's still a bit of difference there, 71% versus 79. Uh, the shading coefficient is, what is it, 53 versus 0.63. Uh, again, it's going to affect the solar heat gain in the building. Uh, but I would task anyone to, uh, if they could tell the difference between a U value of 1.1 and 0.9, there's probably not a lot in it if you're sitting beside the window. Triple glazing does present challenges uh, with regards to how big a glass panel you can actually make. It actually it adds weight and cost to systems. Uh, currently, right now, we've only got a UPV system. UPVC system that can allow for triple glazing. Although those new products that I've referred to uh, earlier on in my presentation will accept uh, triple glazing. Hey, we don't think it's going to be necessarily a big thing. Um, I think double glazing is still preferable. A lot of the glass companies would prefer to do double glazing versus triple glazing. Um, but we'll just see what the, uh, where the market goes with that. So I mean, glass typically um, provide a protection from the wind, rain, uh, but allowed us a connection to the outside, right? And some visible light. So IGUs or double glazed units or insulating glass units, um, they can be designed specifically to control any of those points there. So noise, glare, solar gain, heat loss, or fading reduction. It really just depends on the composition of the glass and what type of glass you're using. If you didn't know already, we opened a glass factory about a month ago in Cambridge. Um, it is probably the most modern glass factory in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and we will initially start uh, supplying glass to our own fabricator network. And this has come as a result of the uh, current poor performance of the, um, the suppliers in New Zealand. You know, we go along to our fabricator conferences and for about five years in a row, all we heard about was how uh, poor the service uh, was. So that motivated us to actually do something about it. So as a result, we've got a glass factory now in Cambridge providing glass to about four or five of our manufacturers to date. And we'll start ramping up uh, production as demand grows. What we did do as part of that process is we we've got our own specifically designed uh, low E glass. So this glass was actually designed specifically for New Zealand conditions. Uh, a lot of the existing low E glasses in New Zealand, uh, technology is about sort of seven years old now. Uh, Solux E was, um, was developed last year, 2019. Uh, we've sourced it from AGC in Singapore and it's only available through AGP so Architectural Glass Profiles is our glass company. So just a really quick chart on the left there, industry standard low E glass uh, versus the AGP Solux E on the right. Someone asked me the other day, what does this actually mean? Uh, it means that we've got um, more dots than they have. <laughs> Um, for further information, obviously, uh, hey, all of our products are on EBOS, uh, Master Spec, Product Spec. We do offer uh, assistance in writing or editing uh, specifications. And if you haven't already got one, I'm sure you have, but you can put a request in through EBOS for our latest specifier guide. So we do offer assistance to the architectural community. Uh, we have a, lot, a large tech team who can help you with your projects and if you're looking for specific thermal values obviously we can assist there as well. So in summary thermal efficiency in windows is a number of small improvements so it's never just one thing it's a number of different things. Uh, houses have been completely sealed off by the installation of cavity wall insulation, loft insulation, triple or double glazing, draft proofing throughout and have become moisture traps but condensation is not a window problem. And usually the appearance of condensation is a result of lack of ventilation. Uh, low E glasses obviously will help with your visible light transmission, transmission shading coefficient and your U value performance. Thank you. 
All right. Hey, thanks, Philip. Um, I like that we've got more dots than they do. Uh, <laughs> it's it's um, very technical. Now, we've got a couple of quick uh, questions here. And while we're sort of going through a summary, uh, if you would like to record your attendance for either NZRAB or ADNZ, if you can put your name and number on the Q&A line, we'll record that for you. Uh, Philip, a few questions for you. Durability of the argon filled IGU glass. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on that, please? So uh, insulating glass units carry a warranty of 10 years. Uh, that's industry standard. Um, so whether that be Metro or Viridian, uh, AGP offer a 12 year warranty on their units. Argon, generally, uh, when they put argon into an IGU, some of it is absorbed by the desiccant that's used in the spacer bars. But once it's been absorbed in the desiccant, uh, no more of it can leak out. Uh, so there have been tests done. And they have talked about, uh, I think it's about a 2% degradation uh, per year. But uh, if you were having argon leaking out of the unit, you would probably have uh, formation of condensation in there as well. Right. Okay. So you have some signs. Okay. Yeah. Um, what at the, you talked about the new um, Solux E glass. Um, just do you have any notes around light transmission for, for that product? Uh, yeah, actually, I prop, they are somewhere. Obviously, um, the glass plant <laughs> is, all, is all a bit new to us. I, I probably do have that information. Uh, yep. So if someone wanted to email me uh, or through, through eBoss, if they want to contact me through eBoss, I can yep. probably uh, provide them with that information directly. Great. Okay. Um, and... Right, so that we've got a, uh, a request if you could provide an IGU specifying guide, uh, as you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, again, so uh, we can, we can we've got that in the notes there, so we can get that yeah. out. Um, so so AGP is actually uh, on master spec as well. Okay, great. Uh, for everyone else, appreciate your attendance. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday, and we will see you next week at our next TechEd webinar. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. Yeah.